two, one. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Boyles. I am executive director of Mass Humanities, and we're so glad to welcome you all to the season finale of Miss Mass, our collaboration with the Mississippi Humanities Council. Tonight is a special night as we take a look at the blues here uh, from some different festivals and musicians and scholars. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to work with our colleagues in Mississippi. We've been doing this since last December in an effort to connect audiences through the humanities around topics that we felt like might bring us a little closer together, uh, things we wanted to ask, questions we wanted to follow, and stories we wanted to hear. Uh, it's been a particular pleasure for me to work with uh, Carol Anderson, who's going to uh, come on now and tell you a little bit about the uh, housekeeping and, and, and order of things for tonight. Hey, Carol. Hey, thank you, Brian. I'm Carol Anderson with the Mississippi Humanities Council. And yes, I'm gonna give you a couple of quick housekeeping to uh, tips to get you through the evening. Um, the best thing is to keep your audio muted throughout the program so we can focus on our presenters. And if you turn your audio on, don't be offended. We might come in and mute you for, your, for you. Um, you should rename your video like mine has been renamed Carol Anderson and a dash and then MS for my state, or I'm sorry, you can put it in the front and MS and then your name, but do rename yourself so we know what state you're from. And um, just be aware that throughout the evening, we are gonna spotlight the speakers. So the best way for you to experience that is to, um, to put your view in uh, speaker view, not gallery view. And if you need any technical assistance through the night, just throw it into the chat at the bottom of your screen and we will try to jump on and help you. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Brian to start our introductions. Thanks, Carol. So tonight we look at the blues, how the music lives in Mississippi and Massachusetts, the audiences and musicians and presenters who sustain it, and how the musicians and music festivals have been impacted by the pandemic. This is a music that's faced oppression, uh, that's fueled struggles for freedom, and it's been a part of celebrations. And today, um, to quote uh, the blues singer Robert Brown, as times now ain't nothing like they used to be, I think it's important that we hear about the blues from these musicians and festival organizers and from scholars, because the blues has always provoked great questions around American identity and the times in which we live. It's a great pleasure to welcome tonight uh, to lead our first part of our conversation, Scott Beretta, who's a writer and researcher for the Mississippi Blues Trail uh, and the host of Highway 61 on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. He also teaches courses at the University of Mississippi uh, where he served as editor of Living Blues Magazine. Scott's the co-producer of a documentary, Shake Em On Down, about the great blues man from Mississippi, Mississippi, Fred McDowell. He served on the team that created the B.B. King Museum and has created a podcast about field recordings in Mississippi. In 2016, he received a Governor's Awards, uh, Arts Award in Mississippi Heritage. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Okay. Am I here? All right. Uh, First of all, I got to explain what you're looking at here, <laughs> because I am at the uh, Bentonia Blues Festival in uh, uh, Bentonia, Mississippi, which is located just northwest of Jackson and uh, just southeast of the Mississippi Delta. I'm actually in the back room of the uh, uh, Blue Front Cafe, a juke joint, and that's why we have this uh, uh, beautiful sheet, which uh, wasn't ironed, and we just have one uh, 
single uh, uh, light bulb here that's uh, illuminating the room. Uh, we'll later be joined here by uh, Jimmy Duck Holmes, uh, the bluesman who runs the Bentonia Blues Festival, whose family has run the uh, uh, Blue Front since uh, 1948. Uh, so uh, I'll talk more about Jimmy and his, his distinctive style, the style that he plays, which is particular to this area when he's featured in uh, about 25 minutes or so. But uh, first I wanna give some brief remarks about African-American traditions here in Mississippi, notably the blues and hint at those traditions and the blues related traditions uh, in, uh, Mass in Massachusetts, uh, where our other panelists will be able to address uh, those in more detail. Uh, the blues is thought to have emerged around the 19, 1890s or so, as Maya can explain later, uh, we can find its and other African-American music's roots in both Africa and in North America during the uh, slavery and immediate post-emancipation eras. When we talk about the blues emergence as a genre uh, rather than as a feeling, you all have probably heard of blues as a feeling, uh, as it's often described, we're mostly talking about it in technical terms. So when uh, for instance, many blues are characterized by an AAB pattern, which means the first line is repeated twice with answer line. Answer line uh, that's commonly used as a 12 bar structure and uh, distinctive chord changes. And when jazz artists talk about playing an instrumental blues, that latter characteristic of these the characteristic chord changes is often what they're referring to. Uh, something else which is very distinct about the blues is its use of first person. That's to say that the blues vocalist is often singing about their own experiences and feeling. And earlier forms of music often were in the form of ballads, uh, which were telling stories in the third person or had more of a collective orientation, such as with the spirituals. So around 1900 or so, we witnessed the rise of this new form of music, which gives expression to the experiences of contemporary African-Americans through an individual voice. And of course, this was a pretty horrible time for African-Americans in terms of segregation, institutionalized racism, a uh, very high number of lynchings here in Mississippi and elsewhere, and the prevalence of the very unfair uh, sharecropping system, which surrounded this area, which was dependent on cotton production. So the blues is often associated with or as seen as reflecting that terrible oppression. Uh, but we can also see how the blues reflected the creativity and tenacity of African-Americans under very difficult situations. And many blues artists have countered the stereotype that blues is inherently sad by pointing to how it served as a release valve for dealing with one's problems as a form of catharsis, if you will. Uh, we can thus see playing the blues, the music, as a way of getting rid of the blues, the feeling. So even if the blues on the surface seems to be a music of complaint, it's something that's often enjoyed collectively as a way of dealing with one's problems, often through using dark humor. As Mississippi, uh, Mississippi's B.B. King sang, nobody loves me but my mother, and she might be jiving me too, right? So that's a, a great example of the kind of humor that you find in the blues while somebody's ostensibly complaining. And if you go to see blues performances, you'll find that a lot of the songs have a joyous nature. Uh, and this goes for the music a uh, hundred or more years ago as well. Uh, for one, it was very often dance music. That's something that maybe we forget about sometimes if we listen to Robert Johnson or a lot of the early music, which doesn't really resemble that much uh, contemporary dance music in a lot of ways. Um, Mississippi is a place which is widely regarded as a uh, home of the blues. Uh, but from a historian's perspective, and I work on the Mississippi Blues Trail where we have to sometimes address the stereotypes, uh, we can't really say that it actually is the home of the blues. Um, it's or the birthplace of the blues. Memphis actually claims to be the home of the blues. And if you, if you drive into Mississippi, the road signs now say, uh, welcome to the birthplace of uh, American music, and that's not something you can prove wrong, uh, and it would probably not be as uh, viable if people were in Arkansas or Alabama. For what, for whatever it's worth, we have those uh, stereotypes or understandings on our side in terms of, uh, in today's world, promoting Mississippi blues. And right now in the background, you can hear one of the many festivals that take place 
throughout the year, um, dozens and dozens of festivals um, uh, that are partially the result of the state embracing the blues as an economic driver. You know, we're trying to give a lot of respect to it, particularly those of us who are involved um, academically or as advocates for the blues, but the state has also become interested in the last uh, decade or so in promoting the blues. And uh, so uh, anyways, uh, we don't really have, so we don't really have that much knowledge about where the first blues songs appeared. There were some early reports from Mississippi and uh, around 1900, uh, 1903, W.C. Handy recalled encountering somebody who played the blues, but he didn't discover the blues. He was called the father of the blues, but he learned it from other people. Uh, and uh, so there were some reports from Mississippi, but the great Ma Rainey, hopefully some of y'all saw the great uh, uh, dramatization on, uh, recently on TV uh, about Ma Rainey. Uh, she recalled hearing it in Missouri uh, around 1900. And Missouri's uh, a place that was the found where around the same time as the blues emerged, uh, ragtime emerged, one of the three great African-American modern uh, music, musical traditions that emerged around that time, uh, jazz being the other one. So while blues might have uh, influenced ragtime or jazz, uh, the si uh, wow, we are uh, we're having a train in the background right now. Not only do we have a festival, but uh, this, this is where the, uh, the train runs through, uh, uh, somebody just wrote reality. Yes, this is reality here. Uh, that the uh, train that runs from the city of New Orleans train runs right through here. I don't know if that's what that was, uh, but anyways. Uh, any so uh, why why do we associate Mississippi with the blues? Well, one thing is that Mississippi was overrepresented in terms of the number of artists who recorded. Right. So if you look at blues artists who recorded you see that um, a, a great number of them are from Mississippi. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that our the, the migration patterns to Chicago uh, from Mississippi led to a lot of people being recorded through uh, the studios in Chicago. And we can see that uh, that influence of the early Mississippi blues was in a lot of ways more uh, profound for post-war blues music uh, than was the case with say Texas music or music from the East Coast. Uh, so for example, we can draw a line from early Mississippi blues pioneers, including Charlie Patton and Sun House through Robert Johnson in the 1930s uh, to uh, Muddy Waters and Elmore James who moved from Mississippi to Chicago. And they in turn inspired rock artists such as the Rolling Stones. Uh, this points to the great role of the uh, great migration uh, in spreading the blues beyond the deep south. We can see in all of these cases a push-pull explanation of all the cases across the south. Pushing out of the south was often due to racism and uh, poor social conditions, political conditions, and the pull can often be seen in terms of the new job and social opportunities to the north. Many Scott, Mississippians went due north, stopping in St. Louis and Chicago. Many Texans and Louisianans moved to west coast. Uh, and so influencing the blue styles that took off there. Many African-Americans from the Southeast migrated to cities, including Washington, Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. And not only the blues was spread, but other musics influenced by the blues, including jazz, R&B, uh, modern gospel. Um, one thing I hope that we can address today is, that the, uh, the, is the diversity and richness of African-American traditions uh, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, when we first talked about this, my first thoughts about Mississippi and Massachusetts was that of the relationship uh, during the blues revival uh, when Boston and Cambridge played a major role in the uh, folk and blues revivals. Uh, one of the most famous people during that era was Taj Mahal, who grew up in Massachusetts, and a number of Massachusetts residents, including Dick Waterman, traveled to Mississippi to locate older musicians who recorded in the 20s and 30s, including Skip James, who was here in Dentonia. But if we look beyond the most visible scenes in Cambridge and Boston, we find a real diversity of African-American music across the state in terms of gospel, soul, R&B, jazz, folk music, hip hop, notably Gangstar and Guru. And one of the most fascinating things I think is that there was direct African music link to Massachusetts. 
there was a significant immigration from the Cape Verde Islands off the west coast of Africa, initially through the whaling industry and later through more conventional immigration. And um, one thing that may have also resulted in African American music in Massachusetts not being better known is that it wasn't, relatively speaking, a major center for recording like Chicago was. Chicago, the presence of the recording industry in Chicago probably had a lot to do with the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the music getting develop, uh, developing a larger audience. Uh, and so in the absence of that, I just wanna say that that makes the role of cultural programming and festivals that much more important. And I wanna talk now with some people who are experts on this topic. Um, Maya Cunningham is an Africanist, African-Americanist, ethnomusicologist, Africana studies scholar, jazz vocalist, and cultural uh, activist. She's completing a PhD at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in Afro-American studies with a concentration in ethnomusicology. Uh, Maya's research focus is on intersections between African and African-American identities and traditional Black music, as well as ethnomusicological approaches to culturally responsive music education for African descended students. In 2017, uh, Cunningham launched the Ethnomusicology in Action program, a project of Thimba Arts and Culture Inc. that uses educational programs, professional development for teachers, music and broadcast media to advance heritage education about Afro descendant expressive cultures, music and other arts. Uh, Kristen Neville is originally from New Orleans and was the wife of the late Charles Neville, a jazz saxophonist who was also the elder in the Neville brothers. Kristen was inspired to use her connections in the jazz world to bring arts access to underserved people and leverage the arts as a tool for social change. To explore and prepare to implement her vision, she obtained a master's degree in public policy administration with a concentration in nonprofit management from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And in 2012, okay, in 2012, she used the entire four-year program to research and develop ideas for Blues to Green. Uh, this included traveling to meet with nonprofit executive directors and writing research papers on engaging the public with climate change and biodiversity loss through music and cultural events, arts-based nonprofits engaging youth in social enterprise, and more. And she founded Blues to Green in 2013 and has designed and executed the Springfield, Massachusetts, Jazz and Roots Festival annually since 2014. Okay. Okay, am I, can you all hear me? We can hear you, Scott. Thank you. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> Hi, well, uh, what, what did I say that you want to add on to? I, probably, I had to rush through that and I didn't say all that much about the diversity of uh, of what's going uh, of Massachusetts African African American music in Massachusetts, and I'd love to hear what what you all are doing. What are, like that? You sounds like you've been involved in uh, wonderful programs for many years. Maya. Well, I think maybe the, the thing to think about concerning African American music in Massachusetts is yes, you know, African American music certainly is represented in recordings, but it really is the music that people make every day. So it's the music of the black church, it's, it's blues, it's you know, different gospel outlets, it's other kinds of music that African-Americans African -American, African make every day. And another thing that I think is interesting is that there's a very interesting migration pattern from Mississippi and even New Orleans and Louisiana to Springfield. Um, and so that's just something to consider when we think about uh, the living traditions. That are that are here in, in in Western Massachusetts, especially. Yeah. Well, what can you tell us about like the Great Migration? I know that it, we we talk about the Great Migration in terms of the sort of the World War One era and then the, po the World War Two, post World War Two era. Mm -hmm. And uh, what who came to Massachusetts? I mean, from the South in particular. Well, um, I think different, there are different flows to different areas of Massachusetts. Generally, the, the, you mentioned some of the flows, like Mississippi, Alabama, Chicago, Detroit, Louisiana, Texas, to the west, western centers like Oakland, Louisa, uh, LA, and then, you know, the kind of the eastern seaboard, the Carolinas, 
to DC, Philadelphia. Uh, I think there might even might even be like a North Carolina, Philadelphia uh, kind of trajectory that we see. And then um, I, I, it seems I've been here a little while in, in Springfield. I'm from Washington DC, but I've met oh. many, many people who are originally from Mississippi or whose parents or grandparents are from Mississippi. Right, and I remember Taj talking to me. I, I was communicating with you that the other day that when I interviewed Taj for Living Blues, we put him on the cover. Excuse me, somebody wants into the room here. <laughs> we have the room locked so we don't get Jimmy. Jimmy's actually coming into the room now. Uh, but uh, anyways, when I talked to Taj Mahal, uh, he uh, told me he immediately thought I was kind of maybe questioning his authenticity by noting that he was from Massachusetts. I think he bristled at that, that people thought you couldn't be an authentic bluesman if you grew up in Massachusetts. And he immediately pointed to, well, my family's from Mississippi and I grew up around Mississippians, right? That our social patterns at the home, it didn't matter that I'm in the state of uh, Harvard and blah, 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 but my immediate surroundings were Mississippian and people from the Caribbean as well, right? Which uh, we don't have that influence at least directly so much in Mississippi, but is, is that also something we find in Massachusetts? A, a Caribbean diaspora community? Uh, okay, I think we kind of lost you there, Scott, but I'll just answer. I know there's a huge Haitian diaspora community in Boston. Apparently here in Springfield, there's a, 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 more, a smaller, more quiet Jamaican diaspora community, certainly. And then different area, people from different areas of Africa as well. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, oh. I had a little, a little connectivity issue there. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy Duck Holmes has, uh, has come into the room now. So that's- Hello, Mr. Thing. Holmes. Hello, Mr. Holmes. There he is. Everything is good. Everything is good. We'll have you on as the, as a feature, the featured guy in a couple minutes or about 10 minutes or so. Uh, mm -hmm. Is uh, Kristen there? I'm here. Yep. Oh, hi, Kristen. Hi. Hi. Welcome to. Uh, we're uh, we're here at the uh, Blue Front uh, Cafe here in uh, uh, Mississippi at a juke joint during a festival with uh, trains running by and uh, elaborate sets here. <laughs> but but anyways, I'd like to know. Uh, uh, Maya talked about uh, different routes there from. Uh, Mississippi, I talked about Taj Mahal, and you're from New Orleans, and you tell me about how did you get up there, and what were the conditions? Well, I have to make a correction. I think <clears throat> I think there's a typo on our website. Because oh, okay. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to be accused of, though, is it? <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I'm actually from Western Massachusetts. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I moved down to New Orleans, and and met my husband Charles there and several years later brought him back to Massachusetts. So um, I brought some of New Orleans mm -hmm. up here <laughs> and uh, you know, he was a, a big influence on me and in starting this nonprofit and I'm using, fading out here. using music to, um, you know, try to bring people together and um, affect positive change. And uh, you know, I, um, felt there were similarities between Springfield and New Orleans. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just kind of sensing a, a sort of cultural divide between um, folks in, in Springfield and the surrounding area. And I guess Springfield is um, considered one of the uh, most racially segregated metro areas in the United States. and. So just seeing music as a way to bring people from you know diverse communities together, um, and so our festival is one that celebrates you know the music of the African diaspora. So it's you know it's not solely focused on the blues, but a range uh, right. you know from jazz to blues and um, gospel and soul and funk and New Orleans music and uh, Afro-Cuban music and bomba and, and salsa and um <clears throat> and um but we have had some you know blues artists like Taj Mahal coming home which was a, a really big deal we had a, our biggest audience that year um and uh you know Liz Wright and um but you know the other 
other groups uh, um, performing. The, the blues is woven in through, you know, through most of it. Um, and, uh, you know, the, just seeing and feeling um, the relationship between them. Um, and along with the performances that we have, we, we try to um, have some educational programming. And actually Maya and I have been working on a, a program, um, developing a curriculum and <clears throat> working to bring um, artists into the public schools and, and um, you know, center black music history and culture. And um, so we just had Elio Villafranca, who is a Cuban pianist uh, last week um, come up and, um, and he presented his new work called Standing by the Crossroads. And, um, and in talking with him about, about that, like the symbolism of the crossroads for him, um, you know, in uh, Afro-Caribbean um, religions, it, it's, you know, very significant. And, you know, I was thinking about the reference to that in, in the blues and Robert Johnson and his crossroads blues and, um, and just in African American uh, um, folklore and, and um, just thinking about that concept and how, you know, from Elio's perspective, it, there's this, uh, you know, keeper of the crossroads who um, is uh, one who opens the gateway between the physical world and the spirit, spiritual world. And, and just interesting to think about, um, you know, the reference to it um, in, in America of the, of, so the story of Robert Johnson going to the crossroads and selling his soul to the, the devil and, um, uh, and, you know, sort of this, you know, reference to the devil when it was, I think, coming from something very different and, and how, um, how blues and jazz and rock and roll has been referred to as the devil's music. And, you know, so with our festival, we're trying to celebrate <laughs> this music that is, you know, uh, you know, the African based um, roots of American music. Um, so that's what I have to share. <laughs> I think I oh Scott did you I was just uh, uh, here you go okay what's that well no I was just waiting for you Scott I was going to say something uh to add on to what Kristen said but I don't know if you had a, a question for us no I, no I didn't I was just uh saying Jimmy's here and he was concerned about something happening at the festival so oh, uh, okay uh I think it's interesting the mythology, Kristen, that you you the the crossroads mythology connected to the blues. There's this, this kind of blues lore that is developed around the music and around the the culture of the music. And I I, I wonder, you know, I, I remember going to um, when I was in the Delta several years ago, going to uh, Robert Johnson's grave, and there were all of these different kinds of tribute items that had been placed on his grave and you know but i will say that his sisters did recently write a book about him and you know that kind of very sonorous serious faced photograph that's often featured of him uh well they put in the same in the same session photography photography session he's smiling and so they they decided to put that uh image of him because that's the brother that they knew so there's kind of this kind of you know, kind of, I would, I use like a technical kind of anthropological where there's a kind of an etic perspective of Johnson and, you know, the blues lore and the crossroads. And it's kind of like the insider thing to, you know, the way, you know, the musicians are, are interact with in, within their own communities and families. So it's, it's an interesting uh, discussion, I think. So I know that one, one of our, um, one thing that we wanted to talk about was how are the music, blues and other kind of African-American roots music continues to be nurtured and celebrated. I know it's happening definitely with the Springfield Jazz and Roots Festival, definitely in scholarship. But you know, Kristen, maybe we could talk a little bit about the way our concerns, you know, with um, bringing it into the educational lives of, of young children. Oh, you know, uh, the schedule, we've got, uh... Is Jimmy's on now? And 
if he's got a he's he's worried about running out to his festival to take care of security and stuff and uh, we're supposed to switch over to him at 6 30. can we return to that during that discussion a little bit later about festivals uh, sure scott sure oh, scott sorry, whatever, yeah, jimmy, whatever you want to do I, I, here jimmy and jimmy just had something interesting to say about oh, you want to sit in this chair jimmy i heard you like this chair better you don't have to sit in that chair no jimmy okay let me get the uh camera on uh, jimmy and i uh can you hear me now yeah everything okay i see carol uh, Jimmy, uh, you just had something to say about the devil, and you probably heard a lot about the blues and the devil over the years. What do you think about uh, that idea? The devil get accused of a lot of stuff. The devil is like Jesus Christ. It's your choice. Do you want to follow the devil's choice? Or you want to follow Christ? But now, he was talking about another question. Blue just happened. It ain't stayed, he's not rehearsed. And Scott, my personal friend, he's still yet to get there. <laughs> <laughs> my personal friend, he's still yet to get. Blues is not staged. It's not rehearsed. Just do it. Scott, my personal friend, he still don't get there. Now guess what? We sit back here, and we get up on that stage tonight to play. I'm gonna make a song about what he, he may give up interrupting me. Uh-oh. Like this is so special. I ain't nothing special old man, but life and death. <laughs> well, would you mind uh, talking a little bit about your tradition? Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> what, what, we, what we are sitting now, this is a very barbershop. And before the barbershop, this was my mom pressing room. The plantation owner would come, but we are sitting right now. We do their laundry, wash it, bring it here for mom to press it. It's opposite of this one point, opposite this wall was a kitchen. She cooked. This little hole in the wall, which y'all call a juke joint. She took care of 14 kids. Right. And you've been running this juke joint since how long? Jimmy? My, myself. Come, come July 1st, myself, 51 years. Myself, 51 years. And now I've been a part of my life since I was one year old. Mm -hmm. I was born in 1947. My mom and dad started in 1948. Now I get asked a lot of questions. I can't answer because they said the reason I can't answer. I'm on the inside. They're on the outside looking in. Now this this is something Scott don't know. There's a big difference between a juke joint and a juke house. Big difference. A juke a juke joint. My mom and daddy's staffing was licensed, regulated by the state. A juke house was somebody who set aside a room in their house to party after hours. Right. When life, you know. Right, right. They'd board up, they'd take the furniture out in the yard and things like that. Uh -huh. But this was a this was an institution of the community, right? This is a town of 400 people or something like that. The reason a lot of people chose to do stuff at their home because it wasn't state regulated. This was licensed and state regulated. But what about now she sold something that wasn't state regulated, Jimmy? Well, uh, you know what? It came in big glass bottles and she poured it in shots. Moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> Did she make moonshine in this room, too? No, she sold, sold a hell of a lot of it. But pull on beyond that, we just do find with a juke joint. But it also is community, social, definitely play. And it also was a community center. You came to bed, Tony, go to your blue farm. You're looking for someone. Somebody in here is going to be able to tell you you're looking for it. Don't put your dad on. And how, uh, and how important was that during the segregation era? Real important. Real important? I mean, this was the place where African-Americans could feel at home. Yeah, is that home. correct? And some people call it staple food. But when the federal government would distribute food to the city community, this the blue farm was a designated point where they, they called it a commodity. They would drop it here. And 
It would notify the, it would notify the people in their community, go to the blue farm, get you some food. Not to be sold. So it, it, the blue farm was more than just a joke drawing. Right. Would you tell us about the music that was played here? What what is the style of music that uh you make and he's got a guitar, I don't know if you can talk about it with the guitar in your hands. No, the music that was played him when I hear a guy was boasting about Hill Country. It was so much hill country music played here, but I don't down nobody. But the attention that blue the blue fine getting bit because of that bit style of blue, which was created by Henry Stuck. Created by Henry Stuck. I could sit in and talk for the next five or six hours. Probably couldn't get through the history part that I know about the blue fine. Again, you know, where we are sitting right now, had two barbers in here, two barber chairs. I look around sometimes, I hear two barber chairs in here, two barbers. Two, and we call it a barber shop. We call it, had two barber, two barber chairs. This was it. I could go on and on talking about the blue front. It was more than just a juke joint. We want to talk, but can you talk about the music? Would you mind showing us what it sounds like? Because you heard, you learned, from, you grew up next door to the guy that founded this kind of music, right? Yeah, the very first guitar I put my hands on, 1957, was a dad talking to me. It has a special tuning, doesn't it? I ain't gonna be able to tune it. It's a very special tuning. I'm gonna say this again, I got to go. Switzerland, so Henry Stuckey, learning from them. I might have my conscious name, but anyway, it's the Henry Stuckey learning from them. But no, he was a war, World War One veteran. He worked in medic, but he well know he was not thought he worked in medic. Mm. If he learned it from them, I'm gonna say this and won't go. Why the hell they come all over to the U.S. looking for Jimmy Duck home to show them how to play it? So he was in World War One as a soldier, and he learned that tuning. Is that what you? That, that's what the but in Switzerland. Yeah. They said Henry Stuck is learning it from them. It must have got lost in the shuffle. They come looking for me to show them how to do it. Well, how do you do it? It's a strange tune of the guitar. I don't read music, but I know how to tune it because that's what Henry told me. He know I told me, he showed me. Can you play a song for us, or like, what does it sound like if you sing it? Kojak with brand new strings on it. Same tune. And I don't want to do nothing. It's going to be on the air and sound it right. Oh. You seen him just putting the strings on it? Yeah. Right. They don't want to hear me, they want to hear me talk the truth. Okay. Well, you are talking the truth, aren't you? Now, once I get Coach out to come back and get it tuned up, will I be able to run a couple songs for you? You can still get it to him. Uh, well, uh, he was saying that his guitar is not tuned right now. He's wondering if he might be able to get back and do one. How long would that take? As soon as Coach got get here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I need to get that stage going. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, if you tell me, I'm going to go make sure to stay. You tell me. You tell me later. What? I'll get asked to court while I'm here. Where do I live? At the blue farm. Uh huh. I go home, take a bath, and get me a nap. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
And you were just celebrated a couple of weeks ago, Jimmy, you played uh, or a month, couple months ago, you got a Grammy nomination and we had a celebration. What did you say about the Grammy? I didn't say nothing about it. Were you excited about it? The interviewer asked me this question. Like, am I going to get the big head? I, I've been wearing a six, seven, eight all my life. My head is like a concrete floor. You can't swell it. <laughs> Listen to this now. You, fans outside. That's my Grammy. Me, the fan, me and the fan that's outside, that's your Grammy? That's my Grammy. The people that come to see you in the community? That's my Grammy. All right. Grammy the trophy. Collect dust. You don't collect no dust. Uh -huh. yeah, Some might argue about that, but uh, what about this president? I appreciate <laughs> being nominated now. <laughs> What's the what is the value of this place as a community? Like right now, and what you do the festival is that does that? Uh, what is it? How does it benefit the community? What are you doing for the community by having this festival? They don't. Well, yes, they don't. They look at it as though last year's festival is seeing some of the relatives came to the festival. This year's festival, the relatives come back. Not so much as the, the festival to be with the family. You mean this, you're talking about the relatives of Henry Stuckey? The whole community. The whole community. But you've been doing this for 30 years, so you have uh, you have a lot of outsiders. I'm, you have I'm, people. I've been doing it for 49 years. 49 years, right? Okay. A lot of the local drama wise. Don't look at it music wise or stuff. You know, relatives live in the north, wherever. It's true. This week or the stuff, they come back home. So you're country. saying that there's a lot of homecoming events in exactly. Mississippi for African Americans exactly. in particular, and they schedule it around here because, not because they're necessarily blues fans, but because exactly. they, uh, exactly. they, they feel comfortable here too. Would you say that? I mean, We've had a lot of racial divisions in Mississippi and oftentimes with the festivals, uh, you find all white audiences or relatively speaking are all African-American, but that's not the case with yours. This Scott, Scott, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is Carol hopping in. Yeah. I need to, I need to get, to, in order to keep us on schedule, can I, I get us to, but he's, okay. I was trying to cover the stuff in the next section from uh, him. Well, I, I know, thank section. you. I'm so sorry. To hop in. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to um, bring Maya back in. We've got okay. another section here. So um, in this, thank you, Mr. Holmes, by the way, very much. This has been a, a, a really great experience to be with you. Um, so Maya Cunningham is going to lead our next conversation with Kristen Neville. And um, I think Jimmy is going to stay with us. And they're going to discuss the impact of COVID on their work on their festivals, clubs, events, and how they're reconnecting with audiences now as the pandemic is approaching an end. So I will turn it over to you, Maya. Thank you, thank you. So we all know that COVID-19 was definitely disruptive to, uh, to live music events, to festivals, and Kristen and, and maybe Mr. Holmes, when he comes back, can you share with us, and I actually happen to know because I was involved, but how did you all deal with um, with 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 still presenting the festival and how did you deal with the pandemic with with concerning the Springfield Jazz and Roots Festival? Oh, Kristen, you're muted. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, yeah, just as we were starting to get things rolling last year with our um, fundraising, things got shut down and you know, we saw that we weren't going to be able to have a festival. So we had to kind of rework things with the, the few funders that we had had at that point. And we, um, we did a virtual event, um, which Maya was a co-host of. And, um, you know, we, we uh, took that opportunity to just, um, you know, say we're still here and to remain in people's consciousness. And, and I think, you know, with festivals, um, people look forward to them at that particular time of year and, you know, become sort of a, a ritual and, you know, having something to mark that time um, and a time when people, you know, normally come together and share in this experience. So we, we wanted to, you know, create something um, 
where people could kind of feel that connection, even if it was virtually. And we like reflected on the previous years of the festival with some great um, footage of performances and then conversation about the music. And, you know, it was, it was really special to look back on it and, and also say, well, you know, we're planning to come back <laughs> next year. And, you know, um, Fortunately for us, we didn't have like a building to um, pay, you know, to have um, operating costs to maintain. And um, I know some uh, venues um, did close and it's, it's nice to see that there are some new ones that are about to open up like in Springfield and the area where we're going to um, uh, have the festival this year. There are a few new, um, venues opening up in that area. Um, and, <clears throat> and, you know, some pe people got very creative and innovative during that, that time. For me, it, it was sort of a needed break because <laughs> um, it is a heavy lift to pull all those pieces together of a, of a festival and be responsible for those. So it was nice to have a little breather. Um, um, but, you know, I, you saw the innovativeness of, of artists, you know, those who um, uh, maybe were more technologically savvy and could have an online presence or those who took the time to dive into their writing and creating new material. Um, you know, it was nice to see venues, presenters sort of collaborating more and sharing um, what they were going through and sharing um, information about resources and and um, uh, we actually collaborated with a, a production company, uh, Laudable Productions, um, who created this online platform for virtual concerts and <clears throat> and was building a coalition of, of presenters to try to help keep things going. And we did a couple of um, virtual concerts with them and. Uh, and, um, and I think coming out of this, there'll be sort of a new hybrid model um, where there'll be the in-person um, event, but it can also be live streamed for those who can't be there or maybe choose not to be there if they don't feel comfortable. Um, and, and right now we have this, because things are different um, and you know, without the, runway for our normal fundraising, it, our event's gonna be smaller, but we have this opportunity to sort of shift things because we're in this different situation. So we're actually planning to shift the location of the festival a little bit and, and start this building this sort of new model for it that's more distributed and engaging other venues and um, restaurants and are you all using a hybrid? So I'm curious about. We'll circle into what happened with the blue with the uh, the festival down in um, at Blue Front. But I'm curious. Are you all using is Springfield Jazz and Roots Festival using a hybrid model this year? Uh, we're looking into that. So I, I'm not definite at the moment, but that's a possibility. Oh, I see. So kind of less like big crowd and kind of more. It's, small venue, but still festival. Is that what you're, you all doing? Yeah. Um, so it uh, will be situated in a park that's not as big as the park where we've been and but it's surrounded. Can you tell us where that is, Kristen, just for folks who are in Massachusetts? Where exactly um, will the festival be? Uh, so it's going to be in the Stern Square area. Okay. Worthington Street, uh, Bridge Street and closing off that block and um, just trying to activate the spaces there. There's a few, you know, venues in that area. Um, yeah. And then someone just asked about the website for the festival. Chris, Kristen, do you mind giving mm -hmm. just the website before we? Uh, Springfieldjazzfest.com. Springfieldjazzfest.com. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So we haven't yet started our publicity push, um, but mm -hmm. we're getting. Or just like give us the dates very quickly. What are the dates of the festival this year? August fourteenth. Oh, okay. So not not that soon, but soon enough. Mm -hmm. uh, so August fourteenth. Okay. So folks, listen. Look out for that Springfield 
jazzfest.com. Scott, do you know what happened with the with the um with the festival at at Blue Front during the pandemic last year? How did you all handle that? Well, Jimmy has had events here. Uh, yeah, he did have it last year. Uh, as you all know, Mississippi and Massachusetts had very different approaches to uh, public events. Uh, I'm afraid a lot of people would probably be horrified if you, uh, a month ago when we had the Grammy celebration that, you know, I think we have 30% of our population uh, vaccinated, or is that right, Stuart, or something like that, 30 to 35%. Uh, Jimmy is vaccinated, I'm vaccinated. Uh, but he did it everything outside. The weather is on our side in Mississippi, right? That we can, uh, we can have things outside in a way you could not in Massachusetts. Uh -huh. And what Jimmy has done is had the music out on the front porch and then people brought uh, folding chairs. Uh, and, you know, I was very, I almost came down, but it's in the middle of the gym. I mean, it was 95 degrees today. And, uh, when it's outside of the venue, you're sitting in a chair and either under the few trees or in the asphalt. Uh, so uh, there's a little bit of social distancing of people trying to get back under the trees. Oh, but okay. it stopped having people come into the club, right? Or, okay. Okay. And, but it, people like to film here. He has a number of people that work with him who did Facebook Lives nice. uh, a couple weeks ago. Maybe some of you all have seen that the Black Keys uh, did some videos here and promotion of their new album. They wanted to film in a juke joint and they did that uh, a month or month and a half ago. So there have been events here and he's been, Jimmy, you know, Jimmy is somebody who's very socially conscious about the community. I was, he was trying to get out of here to take care of some issues with the, uh, with the uh, festival. So I was trying to steer him into talking about the social value of the, uh, that's, I wasn't trying to hog the time, but rather, get him to talk about that before he ran out of here but yeah. you know, he, he really values this as he was saying as important for the community uh as for the uh family reunions and uh you know and as i was saying to him that it's uh it's important as a place where the local african americans have been coming here for literally 70 over 70 years and it's been more in more recent times it's become iconic in mississippi blues tourism you know which okay. has been commodified greatly in the last decade or so for better or worse. I, yeah, I do remember seeing- and This is a lot. very important place on the, in Mississippi tourism. I do remember seeing a lot of that when I, when I was there in 2017. So then it sounds like, I mean, my next question was, you know, what is the feel of the climate for jazz, blues, roots, music, festivals, and events? It sounds like there's gonna be no problem reconnecting with, or excuse me, continuing with audiences. What do you all feel about that? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. We've lost or the first Kristen, second. Kristen, what oh, is Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think, I think um, people are hungry for live music, for being able to be with one another. I know some people are, um, have, you know, some reservations and are more concerned than others. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, a couple of, um, shows that had happened recently uh, that friends had produced. Um, the show sold, sold out immediately mm. um, and that it just felt like a very healing experience for those who were there, um, you know, after being isolated and separated for a year. Um, uh, yeah, so, I mean, we're, we're gonna try to address, um, I don't know, the public perception of safety and, you know, do what we can to try to put people at ease. Um, you know, we'll check back in with the city regarding um, capacity limits and we'll probably have a new uh, uh, registration system to have attendees register, even though it's free. Um, so if we have to have a capacity limit or we need to do contact tracing, um, you know, trying to communicate clearly with people about if they've been vaccinated, that they don't have to wear a mask, but if they haven't, they should wear a mask and, you know, maybe have the Department of Public Health there to provide information and sign people up for vaccinations. So Kristen, it does sound like, you know, in both ends, you know, there are safety precautions, but, you know, the show is still moving forward. So just to wind this down, we just have a few more seconds. 
you know, our concern obviously is to continue these living traditions. Um, just very quickly, maybe 10 seconds for each of you. What role do festivals and events play in providing spaces for longtime followers and new audiences to, to enjoy? I'm more interested in the new audience question. How do you all develop new audiences for, for traditional musics that are, that are presented? Just very quickly, Kristen and then Scott. Um, uh, you know, well, we're, we were trying to um, build some new partnerships this year with some younger millennial <laughs> type <laughs> folks um, who may be more in touch with, you know, uh, a younger audience um, to, to reach more of them. We, we um, you know, we try to have some family programming so that there are young people there and have opportunities for youth to connect with the artists that come to learn directly okay. from them. That's very important. Scott, what, what are you all doing on the blue front end con concerning developing new audiences for the blues? Very I quick. would say that you have to look at Mississippi in terms of this sort of wave of cultural tourism, which began in earnest probably around 2003 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of municipalities are jumping on this, not necessarily out of, you know, the love of traditional music, like a lot of like Kristen or myself or musicians, but because it's, it's a resource that, you know, New Orleans has, you know, what is New Orleans economy without tourism and music or we, or Memphis is a place also that embraced that mm -hmm. we're in between them. And one of the things we try to do or the economic people, I'm glad when the people come is to get people to stop when they're driving between New Orleans and Memphis. And that's, I mean, that's like that there, there are out there it's, and we have to tell people, you know, that blues is from Mississippi. This is where you go see it. I mean, that's been the big issue for us. It okay. was never a, yeah, yeah. Okay, so just me. And so I just want to put something in the in your ear, Scott, and in the ear of everybody who's from Mississippi. So I just want to, I, the Clarksdale legacy are, is the blues and the traditional music of African-Americans of Mississippi being taught to young people, particularly young African-American students in public schools. Right? There's one thing to have tourism for people coming from the outside, but our children learning about the heritage, their own heritage that is, that is so rich and so, has, has so deeply impacted the music of the United States, certainly all African-American traditions. So I just want to put that in your ear and, and will to be continued on, on, another, on another level, another time. But that's definitely something for us to all to think about. So Carol, if you could take us into our, our next segment, we appreciate Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Scott, for, for engaging with us on this. Thank you. Thank all the panelists. This was a very good portion of our, our evening, this conversation. And um, yes, we are about now to go into a breakout where we get to talk in small groups with each other. If you will look in the chat, I hope the questions are there. Yes, if you look in the chat, um, Stuart has posted the questions for y'all to engage with. Um, so sit tight, you're gonna get moved on out into your areas.
All right, everybody's coming back, and we'll just give everybody a little time to uh, to return from the breakout rooms. So I was just having a conversation in my breakout room about going to see live music again, and I haven't done it yet, and I know it's going to be um, emotional, and I don't know when it'll be. Uh, and so I'm really glad today to get to welcome uh, Khalif Neville, um, purely for shellfish reasons. I've always liked Khalif's music. Um, the last time I saw Khalif play was actually in front of a gas station in Florence, Massachusetts. Um, and he, I think, brings a really good perspective to the conversation we've been having tonight. So um, I'm going to read a quick bio, Khalif, and then you and I can talk a little bit and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hear from you musically as well. So uh, Khalif Neville is uh, the, born into the first family of funk, the New Orleans Neville family. His dad was Charles Neville of the Neville Brothers, who gave Khalif a unique education from his many years uh, experience playing jazz, funk, and blues. And through those firsthand lessons from his father, Khalif gained an understanding of the roots of American music that not many young musicians have. Having grown up in Western Mass, Cleve has also been greatly influenced by the music scene here in the Valley. And with that gumbo of inspiration, he's discovered his own artistic voice. And recently, Khalif's uh, really gotten interested in film music composition and film directing. And, and that's something we'll talk about a little bit tonight for our, our final segment here. So Khalif, how are you? I'm doing well. Can you hear me? I can hear you crystal clear. Excellent. Sorry that my... How are you? I'm in my studio in my house. I got it spruced up, but every inch other than what's in the frame is complete chaos so that's the art of filmmaking <laughs> <laughs> you've done a good job of self-cropping for sure uh, what town do you live in i live in east hampton massachusetts right now right. okay which for people in mississippi should know east hampton is actually kind of a musical hot spot in this area of massachusetts yeah it is you came back from new orleans right yep i was in new orleans for two weeks got back over the weekend doing a uh film project related to my mom's Kristen, she's my mom by the way uh, her organization blues to green and it was kind of capturing archival footage about my dad charles neville from friends and musicians he'd worked with over the years and it was great who did you talk with uh man, it was a pretty long list but so, yeah. my family i got who my cousin ivan who has the band dumps to funk my sister charmaine my dad's sister, Othelgra, from the Dixie Cups, and um, my cousin Ian, who's also in Dumpster Funk. And then I got a slew of other New Orleans heavy hitters. I got George Porter from the Meters. I got Roger Lewis, who was one of the founders of the Dirty Dozen Brass Band. And I got uh, Johnny Vodakovich, who's one of the greatest New Orleans drummers and a great friend of my dad's, and a couple other people. So it was very productive. So when I lived in New Orleans, I was your... Uh your aunt Charmaine's neighbor and I remember she had pit bulls yeah that, she, she loves her dogs <laughs> <laughs> what did you learn um in those two weeks I mean I think it's probably hard to sum it up but just for you coming back what is like a big takeaway about your dad and about the music well I learned a lot actually my dad had told me some stories here and there but they were always kind of vague and he was a great storyteller so I didn't know if they were totally true or not but uh, a lot of his close friends gave me some insight into his life and uh, the a lot of them met him in the 70s and that was a time period where he was still struggling with things like drugs and uh, you know just wasn't the same guy that I knew and it was interesting to see that perspective but of course was also a, a uh, fantastic musician at that time and just hearing other musicians reminisce about their times playing with him was pretty cool because a lot of the styles of music they played were a lot more uh, virulent in that time period than I think they are today. Not that they're still they're still around, but I just think they were very innovative back then. So yeah. And this project is uh, kind of aligned with the museum exhibition. Is that right? It is. Yeah. Originally, we were going to film the video assets to be showed at the museum, but the timelines didn't quite line up. So they'll probably or they'll definitely be on a uh, kind of sister website to the museum and probably will get added to the museum exhibit a little further down the road. So it's all intertwined. And I, I feel like Kristen told me that the museum exhibition opens in a couple of days, right? At the Springfield Museum. 
yep on saturday the 19th uh, i think it's open from 10 to 5 so go check it out if you're in massachusetts yeah definitely well, you know, one of the questions we had when we went to breakout rooms with people um, was um, what music you've been listening to during this pandemic. Obviously, this thing has stretched on quite a long time. Um, you know, I, there's things I know that stood out to me over the last year and a half that I listened to. But, um, you know, anything for you musically, both as a listener and maybe just thinking about the music over the last, I guess, 15, 16 months. Yeah, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had begun to get into film scoring, which uh, I've always really enjoyed music composition, so that was a kind of natural extension, and I enjoyed the challenge of it, but obviously all my work got tanked the second that the pandemic started, so I kind of just went back to, uh, you know, ground zero and started listening to all sorts of stuff, a lot of things that I wouldn't have listened to if I was, you know, playing shows and trying to stay in a certain musical mindset for the type of music I was doing. So I listened to a lot of kind of uh, cinematic music, film scores and some orchestral stuff, and then got really back into jazz. And I'm a big fan of Coltrane and people like that. And then dove kind of deep into my own family's musical history with a lot of Neville Brothers and some of my dad's uh, records that I really enjoy. So all sorts of stuff. I feel like for a generation probably before mine, the Neville Brothers nationally and globally were New Orleans music. And we've been talking tonight about um, about the blues specifically, which is certainly different than the music they've done. From your perspective, um, when you hear you know people talk about the blues, um, how does it persist in the type of music maybe that you're interested in or the stuff that you hear today? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think... Uh, the blues, and uh, I think Scott was talking about this earlier too, that it came, in my opinion, and from what my dad told me before jazz and before a lot of the other types of American and African-American music. And for that reason, I'd say it influenced all of them. And even though jazz gets pretty far out there and far away from the uh, kind of sound of the blues, I think it's the blues is always present in jazz. And being a younger musician, i I've been into hip hop and I studied a lot of the evolution of hip hop and a lot of that came from sampling jazz records and things like that. And if jazz came from blues, hip hop came from jazz, you know, it's all connected. And I think it's kind of cool. And on a musical level, no matter what you're playing, the blues scale, which there's, there's a few of them, but that sound, it'll work in pretty much anything. So I've enjoyed in some really far out like uh, instrumental um, film scoring sound and music uh, implementing the blues sound in there and it always works just because it's got so much so much uh, heart and soul excellent well um, I think everybody's been looking forward to hearing you so uh, are you ready if you can hear that we're ready I hear it all righty let's do it so I'll just introduce what I'm gonna play before I play it I think I got about 10 minutes so I was going to do three pieces and I'll call it an evolution of the blues because the first one will be one of the first types of blues as I learned, which is a New Orleans inspired blues. Second one is going to be a more jazzy blues, which is something I played with my father Charles a lot. And then the last one will be a kind of modern cinematic instrumental incorporating the blues, showing that it exists through all ages of music. So here we go.
sure if I still have time left, but uh, I can play another one. So let me know. I forgot to time that. You got a couple more minutes. Go ahead. All right, sweet. Let's see. I'll do a um, probably the funkiest type of blues I've ever learned, which is a what I would call a major jazz blues because it takes the traditional blues chord changes and adds like 13 other chords, which is kind of a uh, meme for what jazz is compared to the blues. So here goes. everyone to unmute themselves so we can applaud please I appreciate it remember the name Khalif Neville thank you for being with us Khalif that was that was an unbelievable way to end this evening thanks so much and there's a lot of love for you in the chat. If there's a place for people to follow up and hear more of your music, if you want to drop it in there, just tell us. Um, I think people want to want to hear more. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. All right. Um, I think my buddy uh, Stuart Rockoff is going to come on uh, to close things out for us. Stuart, are you around? Yeah, sure. I'm here. Um, awesome. I was just going to thank everyone, all the panelists uh, tonight, all the scholars, all the musicians um, who have participated in this, our sixth and uh, final Miss Mass program. Um, I want to thank Brian and his team at Mass Humanities for working with us on the series. Uh, the original idea was to bring people together in dialogue from seemingly two very different states and to highlight and explore those connections between us. And I'm a historian, and this is perhaps a bit vain to say, but perhaps in the future, if someone were to look back as a historian and look at this series, they will note the significance of its timing. So while the technology has long existed to hold such a cross-state virtual program, um, we did this series during the time of the COVID pandemic, uh, when so many of us were isolated in our homes, and craving connection. In fact, this is the first time I've done this program for my office rather than my bedroom. Um, and I think that this is the biggest takeaway for me from this series is that no matter our differences, there are always points of connection. 
based around our shared identity as Americans and our common experience of being human. And so thank you all for being a part of this humanities journey. And as we transition back to our old routines and hopefully including going out to hear live music, um, the staffs of Mississippi Humanities Council and Mass Humanities look forward to seeing you all, or as we say down here, y'all, uh, in person again, and to continue these important explorations. So thank you so much, um, and good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good night. Thank, thank you for having us. Thank you for presenting. Thanks thank to you. Scott and Maya and Kristen and Jimmy and, of course, Khalif. Everybody, here? thank you. Oh, you did put it on. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are you muted? I just waved. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Jimmy says thank you as well, I think. <laughs> sorry, I sorry Jimmy had to run out to take care of the festival. It was uh, a good idea, but maybe an execution was a little tough, but uh, glad you got to see a little bit of his character. <laughs> we'll have an after party in a few months, everyone. <laughs> Panelists, thank you so much for uh, all that you did. Uh, I see I've lost Kristen, but thank you so much. You guys put a lot, a lot, a lot of effort into this, and I'm really grateful. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, well, Maya, you get down to New Orleans, it sounds like a good bit. You need to swing by the Humanities Council offices in Jackson if you get a chance. Yeah, no, I, yes, yes, of course, I would love to, absolutely. Khalif, thank you so much for the performance. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. And Scott, I will say, I'm going to send you an email about some things. Okay, thank you. Yeah. About oh, I did, by the way, I did write a, a, fifth, a curriculum for fifth grade Mississippi students through the Mississippi Arts Commission, but, you know, I don't know if anybody's using it. As it often happens, the person who starts an initiative pushes it, when well, then they leave it, you know, disappears. But uh, I hope some. Yeah, that's why it's good for things to go. That's why things like that have to go into. This is the activist side. They have to be uh, instituted or in policy and law. Right. So that schools are compelled to do it, and then that's the way that continues. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Sounds interesting. Okay, I'll send you. Uh, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. I guess we'll. I'll be in touch with uh, the after, after business. Oh. We'll do I, some kind of a follow up. Absolutely. So thanks again, y'all. Okay. Enjoy your weekend. Okay. Thank you. Good, good night. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.